الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا مولانا رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه <تصفيق> اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراتك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته We welcome everyone once again to our Tafsir Al-Quran lessons from the writings of Mawlana Sahib Al-Fayda, Shaykh Ibrahim Niyas radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. Yesterday we concluded a dars al-sani, the second lesson in the tafsir, which is in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the second surah of the Quran. And tonight we will uh, read from a dars al the third lesson, as Sheikh Ibrahim called it, so uh, which is still in Surah Al-Baqarah. So if you have the tafsir with you, it's page 74, or the third lesson. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Al-Fatih lima ughliq wal-Khatim lima sabaq nasir al-Haq bil-Haq wal-Hadi ila saratika al-Mustaqimi. Wa ala alihi haqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-Azimi. ورضي الله تعالى عن أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم يا همة الشيخ أحضري لنا بهذا المحضري وتعطي فيه نظرة تأتي لنا بالظفر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله لا يستحي أن يضرب مثلا ما بعودة فما فوقها الله سبحانه وتعالى says in this ayah that we just recited from سورة البقرة that indeed Allah is not shy. Allah is not shy to give the example of a mosquito or above or anything above the mosquito. Allah is not shy to give an example of a mosquito or anything beyond the mosquito. Now, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring here to uh, the mosquitoes? And uh, what's the purpose of that? But before I go into that, which Sheikh Ibrahim explains, I want to just highlight something else as well. Often I'm asked the question, if Allah is the one speaking in the Quran, which is the haqq, why does he say Allah is not shy to do this? Allah wants to do that. Allah uh, orders you to do this. Shouldn't it rather say, if it is the word of Allah, if the Quran is the word of Allah, that I am not shy of, of, of talking about a mosquito. I order you to do this. I want you to do this. I forbid you from doing this. Right? Why, why is Allah uh, in the Quran? Why does Allah, if Allah is the one speaking in the Quran, why is he saying, Allah wants you to do this, Allah wants you to do that? Like, if I want to say something, to you, I'm not going to say, uh, brother, uh, Fakhruddin wants you to go to the shop. Fakhruddin wants you to sit down. Fakhruddin wants you to stand up. I'm, what I'm going to say is, I want you to go to the shop. I want you to sit down. I want you to stand up. So uh, the ulama have given many reasons for that. And I don't want to go into all the de detailed reasons for that. Why the Quran speaks about Allah in a third person, even though the speaker himself is Allah. Uh, but... Uh, the simplest and the most easy to understand, understand explanation of that is that the Quran was revealed for mankind to recite as prayer and worship. In our salah, in our daily readings, it was revealed for us to read. Now, if we, uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had spoken throughout the Quran directly with I, 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 I want this, I want that. I say this, I say that. What was going to happen is we are going to recite, we are the ones that's going to recite the Quran. Allah is not the one reciting the Quran. He revealed it once to us, but we are the ones who recite it. So when we recite these verses all the time, like we do with the Quran, it's going to sound weird. It's going to sound very awkward because you're going to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I want you to worship me. I want you to pray. I want you to do this. I don't want you to do that. So you're going to read like that. I, 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 and it, it's going to conflate Allah with yourself. And it can cause a big problem both in Sharia and Haqiqah. Okay? I want to stick to your Sharia rather right now. But it's going to cause a big problem. Because you're going to read everything I, I, I. 
it is easier for mankind to understand if Allah speaks about himself, but he speaks in a third person and says, Allah wants it, Allah wants that. So when you read the Quran, you want to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah wants you to pray, Allah forbids you from this, Allah tells you to do this, Allah orders you to do this. That is more appealing to us as human beings. That's more, we can relate to that easier. We can understand that it's, it's a command that Allah is speaking to us, telling us something from himself. Because we are not hearing Allah's voice directly. If Allah was speaking to us directly without any means, he would have said, I want you to do this. That's how he spoke to the prophets. But he's speaking to us through the, he gave us the book and we need to read the book. So that's why in the book, it's always Allah is mentioned in the third, uh, third person. Uh, there are just a few places in the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the first person. Inni, I am Allah. I want you to do that. But that's very few places in the Holy Quran. And that's a tajalli of Jalal. Uh, but most of it is Allah speaking in the third person. And that is the reason for it. And this is important to understand because there are people who attack the Quran and say, well, if this was Allah speaking, then why is he saying, like, why is the book saying Allah wants this and Allah wants that? That means somebody else is writing about Allah. So that's not the case. So we go back to that ayah. It says, Inna Allah, la Allah is not shy. Now the speaker is Allah, and he's saying Allah is not shy to give the example of a mosquito, even a mosquito, to use the mosquito as an example. Now, why, was, why did Allah say that? It's because Malan Shaykh Ibrahim said, Hadi al ayah nazalat raddan li qawl al yahud, lamma darab Allahu al masala bi zubab fi qawlihi ta'ala, wa yaslubu mu zubabu shi'an la yastanqidhuhu minhu. وفي العنكبوت في قولك مصر العنكبوت قالوا ماذا أراد الله بذكر هذه الأشياء الخصيصة This ayah was revealed because in previous ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the example of uh, flies the flies a fly and the spider and a spider so Allah has said about the flies uh, if all mankind come together to create a fly, they will, not be, not, they will not be able to do it. If the whole of mankind comes together to create a fly, a thinking, living fly, they cannot do it. In fact, Allah then said that let alone create a fly, if a fly had to lose a wing, all of mankind together will not be able to replace that wing. The whole of mankind will not be able to replace that wing. So, uh, how weak, uh, you know, are human beings? And Allah also gave the example uh, in another ayah, a surah al the, the, the surah of the spider. Uh, about the spider, Allah spoke about the fight, spider, that kufr, the whole house of kufr is like the house of... Uh, a spider, it's very weak. It's very easy to break. So when these ayat were revealed, the Yahud, the, the Jews at that time in Medina, they made a mockery of it and said, why is Muhammad talking about spiders and flies? And uh, why does your God speak about these most miserable and, and, and these petty creatures like spiders and flies are not important, you know, why does God speak about that? So in response to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in response to the Yahud and, and, and the Munafiqs, who are laughing at that, uh, and saying that this doesn't resemble the words of Allah. Because in the Bible, in the Torah, the Jews have the Torah, which is also the word of God. It, it's a bit of a different style there. It doesn't speak, it gives you the example of a spider or, or, or insects, for example. So they said, these things that Muhammad is reciting, sallallahu alayhi wa they don't resemble the words of God. How can you say this is the word of God? Talking about flies, talking about spiders. So Allah then revealed the ayah, Inna Allah la yastahiyya ma Your Lord Allah is not shy. He's not ashamed of giving the example even of a mosquito. Fama or anything besides it. 
Okay? فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا But those who believe وَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ They will realize that indeed it is the haqq from your Rabb. It's the truth from your Rabb. Those whose hearts are open for faith, they will realize whether the example is of the mosquito or the fly or the spider, they know it's the truth. It's the haqq. It's, the example is true. Why are you concerned about a fly? Is, is what Allah said true or not true? That the whole of mankind cannot create a fly. Is it not true that the, 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 the web of the spider is the weakest, to, easiest to break? So why do, you, why do you undermine those insects, those creatures of Allah? And wallahi, if you continue in your kufr, in your denial of Allah and his prophet, wallahi, those insects are better than you. Those insects are better than you. Because even the flies, they would respect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Sahaba mentioned that from his miracles, were well, that the flies would not sit on him. La tajlis alayhi zubab. That when there were flies in Medina, you see the flies all, you know, they're flying around. But when the time for, you know, when they were around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the gathering, they would not sit on him. They would go sit on everybody else in the gathering, but they will not sit on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even the flies had respect for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you... Uh, Yahudi or Munafiq or Kafir, you don't respect the Prophet Sallam, you, you laugh at him, you mock him. Wallahi, the fly is better than you. The fly respects him and knows him. Even the spider, we know that on the, the night of the Hijrah, when the Prophet Sallam, on the day of the Hijrah, when he migrated from Makkah to Medina, and he stopped in the cave called the cave of Hira. Sorry, excuse me, the cave of Saur. Gharu Saur, the cave called Saur, he hid in that cave for three days with Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. And on the third day, the kuffar who were a search party, they were looking for him, you know, bounty hunters and others, enemies. They came to the cave. They came to that mountain. They made a search all over that mountain. And in the end, they said, look into that cave. And that was the cave they were in. And then they went into that cave uh, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr says, Wallahi, I could see their feet from where we were. We were in like right at the end of the cave, the bottom of the cave. I could see their feet moving. And he said, they just had to walk a little bit further in the cave and they would have found us. And there was a lot of them. And only Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alone in that cave. And then Sayyidina Abu Bakr says, I heard them. I, I, I heard them coming nearby. And then I heard them say, the one man say to the other man, listen, man, let's leave this cave. I don't think there's anything inside here. I don't think there's anybody, anybody could have come inside this place. From the day Muhammad was born. That's the actual words they use. The one said to the other, I don't think anybody came in this cave from the day Muhammad was born. No. And they, they left. And then Abu Bakr said, I heard all of them like leaving. Sayyidina Abu Bakr was so scared that day of, of what they can do to the Prophet وسلم, his love for Rasulullah, that he said, I, I was shivering and sweating because they were so near us and Rasulullah was smiling. And he said, He said, the Prophet said to his companion, don't be sad, Allah is with us. Allah is with us. He said, oh, Abu Bakr, you think it's only the two of us in the cave? Wallahi, the third one is Allah. Don't fear. Even if they are nearby, don't fear, Allah will protect you. So Abu Bakr uh, says, Wallahi, when fans of Allah was to Ali, so when Allah, Allah put the peace in their hearts, Abu Bakr says, Wallahi, all the fear went away from my heart, and I felt at complete peace and ease. But, uh, and then he said, I, I saw them coming, and you know, they, they said what they said, and they left. They didn't go into the cave further. If they had to go a little bit more, they would have found them. So he says that I looked. I went outside afterward to see why did they leave. And I realized that what made them leave was that a pigeon had made a nest and laid its eggs right at the mouth of the cave uh, or at the entrance where we were in. Right in, inside the cave, a pigeon had made its egg and its nest there. It's laid its eggs. 
and a spider had spun its web. So just before anybody can see us, the spider had made a web there. So when the kuffar saw that web and they saw the nest of the pigeon, they said, there can't be any human being inside here, man. We looked in the entire mountain, there's nobody. Uh, how can anybody be inside here when there's a spider? If, if they were inside there, there wouldn't be a spider web and there wouldn't be a nest of, of pigeon. So uh, of the pigeons, so that's why they left. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported his prophet on that night through the, uh, through the spider. As Al-Busiri said in the Burda, Zannu al-Hamama wa Zannu al-Ankabuta ala khayr al-Bariyati lam tansuj wa lam tahumi. Viqayat Allah yaghnat an mudha'afatin min al-Duru'i wa an alim min al-Utumi. So uh, they think, he said the Kufar think that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, the, the spider and the pigeon cannot support the messenger of Allah. So, wallahi, that spider is greater than these kuffar that are making fun of it. Because that spider, it helped Allah's messenger. And these people refuse to do it. So, uh, the believers, Allah says, when they hear of these things, these examples, they know it is the haqq and they believe in it. As far as the deniers are concerned, they see what does Allah want to say uh, with this example? What does He want to say talking about mosquitoes? They, it can't enter their hearts, it can't enter their minds. Allah said, indeed, it will misguide many people because of their kufr, as Shaykh Ibrahim says. And it guides a lot of people because of their iman. Now, this is an important point that the guidance from Allah is one, right? Allah gives you the guidance, gives you the example, gives you the lesson. But not everybody benefits from it. Some people, when they hear the, the message of Allah, they become more misguided. And some people, when they hear the message of Allah, they are guided. It's the same message. But why are some people misguided? Why are some people guided? So that is uh, depending on the hearts of the people. If you look at the message of Allah and you are looking for the truth, your heart is pure, it's open for guidance. Then when the truth comes in front of you, you will accept it and you will submit to it. But if you are arrogant and your heart does not want to accept the truth, it's closed with darkness uh, of sins and haram, then even when the truth comes in front of you, you reject it. The Prophet ﷺ split the moon for the kuffar of Quraysh in front of their eyes and they still didn't believe in him. They said, it's magic. You're fooling our eyes. Even though they are the ones who requested him to do that, he didn't do it until they requested him. They said, if you do that, we will believe. They still didn't believe. Alhamdulillah, we today, uh, we haven't seen the, the splitting of the moon, but we believe in Rasulullah ﷺ. So our hearts are accepting. Their hearts were not. So they said, why does Allah uh, give the example of a, a, a mosquito? Subhanallah. And, and, and uh, people forget that the great tyrant of Babylon, Nimrud, he is the one that used to call himself the Lord God and accept, expect everyone to bow down and worship him, Nimrud. He was the king of Babylon, which is in Iraq today, Iraq. He is the one that threw Ibrahim alayhi salam into the fire. Nimrud is the one who threw Ibrahim alayhi salam into the fire. Because Ibrahim alayhi salam refused to call him the Lord God and refused to make sujood to him. This Nimrud, how did Allah destroy him? Allah did not send a rain of fire or flood them or an earthquake uh, or a splitting of the earth or a storm or a tornado or a how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy Nimrud? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a mosquito. A mosquito went inside the nostrils of Nimrud, na'uzu billah. And they said that the mosquito made him go so crazy with pain that Nimrud would ask his own servants, his slaves, to hit him on the head with a hammer. He would have such a headache that he would tell his own slaves 
hit me on my head with a hammer to calm me down. Subhanallah. This is the man that told Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah's prophet, bow down to me, make sajda to me, that I am your Lord God. Everybody needs to bow down to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliated him such that his own slaves had to hit him, bang him on the head with the hammer. You see, you come in the palace and you see the slaves are hitting the boss on his head with the hammer. And one day the pain was so much, he pulled the hammer from the hand. He said, give it to me. You guys are not doing it right. And he hit himself with the hammer so hard that he cracked his skull, brains came out and he died. One mosquito. So if these people are making a mockery of the mosquito, uh, you know, today, even in our time, one mosquito can bite a person and they get malaria and they die. We live in a time now of this virus, coronavirus. It's something we can't even see. You can't even see it with your eyes. The mosquito, you can still see him, hear him, feel him, kill him even. This virus, you can't even see him. You can't even hear him. You can't talk. You don't, you don't know what's going on with this thing. And it's got the entire world locked down. He's got everybody uh, under fear, ev scared everybody. Jundum min junudillah. It's a soldier from the soldiers of Allah. Allah says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودُكَ إِلَّا هُ وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودُ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُ None knows the soldiers of your Lord, but your Lord. Only he knows his soldiers. Anything can be a soldier of Allah. The visible and the invisible. Anything can be, and anyone can be the soldier of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should never undermine any example that Allah gives us. And furthermore, if Allah is not shy to give the, to teach to the example of a mosquito, we shouldn't be shy to learn from the example of a mosquito or anything else. Today we are shy to learn. Sometimes somebody says, oh, but that person is younger than me, so I can't learn from him. Oh, that person is from another country, so I can't learn from him. Oh, that person is, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, or, or we look at Allah's creation around us, the animals, the birds, and we don't want to learn anything from them. Allah says in the Quran, there is not a single animal that walks on this earth or a bird that flies in the air except that they are nations just like you. Uma mun amsalukum, they are nations just like you. That's a very powerful statement of Allah. They are nations just like us. We need to learn from them, study them. Today you see the Kuffar, National Geographic, right? They are busy studying Allah's kingdom. We are not, we are just arguing about Mawlid and uh, can we use a uh, Subha or can we say Amin or no Amin? Busy with all these foolishness. We are not studying Allah's signs around us. And then we, we feel, we, we are worried why we don't come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was, the Prophet sallallahu said, there was a nation, there was a prophet before, in, before his time, that prophet, uh, he was praying, and then there, were, there was an anthill there, and some ants were coming out of the anthill and disturbing this prophet in his prayer. They were coming and biting him or whatever. They, you know, the ants can disturb you sometimes. So that prophet, he ordered some of his followers to burn the, uh, the, the ant hill. He said, just, just put some fire there. Just burn it, chase them all away, kill them. So they're disturbing me in my prayer. So when he did that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a message to that prophet that indeed, you have burned or destroyed an entire nation that was praising me. Ummatan kanat tusabbihuni. You have destroyed a nation, a nation that was praising me. So those ants were the nation praising Allah. And we are arguing, can we make zikr, can we not make zikr? Should we come together? Should we not come together? The other nations are busy praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, that's an ant. Quran had a surah, surah to Naml, the surah of the ant, surah to Nahl, the surah of the bee. And the Quran has surah to Al-Baqarah and surah to Al-Fil, the surah of the, the, the cow and the surah of the elephant. Big animals, small insects. 
Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Mawlana Shaykh Ibrahim says that talking about the big and the small, he says, Al-Kuffar al-Ladheena antaqadu darab al-Masal bihadi nashay al-Haqeera li ghabawatihim wa amaa qulubihim. He said the Kuffar that are mocking the, the using of the example of the spider or the, the mosquito, he says that is because of their stupidity and the blindness of their hearts. Otherwise, these small creatures of Allah, they are from the most amazing things Allah has created. These small creatures are from the most amazing things Allah has created. And they have from the wonders that even other creatures don't have. Even big creatures don't have what these little ones have. That's why we, 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 fear, the, we fear the mosquito, we fear the spider. You think the spider is a useless little uh, thing? Okay, I'm going to throw a spider at you and see what happens. You are so big, but you run for your life. You see a spider. You are so big, but you're scared of the mosquito and you, you cover yourself. And Subhanallah. So don't undermine these creatures of Allah. Muhammad Shaykh Ibrahim says, Wallahi, they have wonders that even the big ones don't have. He says, فَإِنَّ الْبَعُودَةَ مَسَلًا مَعَ ثِغَرِ جُسَّتِهَا فِيهَا كُلُّ عُضُوِنْ فِي الْفِيلِ وَزِيَادَةُ جَنَاحِينَ He says, the mosquito, despite being such a small creature, has all the parts of an elephant. All the parts that an elephant has, right? Uh, like a tail and, and the, the legs uh, and, and the hands, the arms, or whatever the elephant has, the eyes, the nose, right? The teeth, whatever. He says, the tongue, all the, the body parts that an elephant has, the mosquito has it. Was the other to Janahin? And plus, the mosquito also has two wings. The elephant don't have those two wings. Mawlana Shaykh Ibrahim says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala الذي قدر على أن يخلق الفيل يخلق البعود وركب فيها من العباء والمفاصل قدر ما في الفيل لا عجزه شيء What Allah is trying to tell us is that if I can put all the body parts of an elephant in such a small thing like a mosquito I can put all those parts in a mosquito and put extra parts like wings Indeed, I have power to do anything I want I am the most powerful I can make the dead alive. I can do anything. Allah is trying to tell us that He, ha he is the all powerful. He has power to do everything and anything. That's what He's trying to tell us. That's what we will learn if we study these insects and, and these creatures of Allah. That's what you're going to learn. Well, we, we neglect, we turn away, we're not interested. وخلق الذباب كذلك ضعيفا جعل فيه من الجرأة ما لا يهاب به أحدا. look ما سبحان الله. مولانا شيخ says that that Allah سبحانه وتعالى although he made these insects like the mosquito and the flies small and weak they are very weak yes you know mosquito you, you can just kill him like that a fly you can squash him it's very weak. But he said, despite the weakness that they have, Allah has put in them the courage and the bravery that even the big animals don't have. Right? Now I tell you, a cat and a mosquito, how big is the cat compared to a mosquito or a fly? The cat is very big. But if you go near a cat, the cat runs for his life. But if you go, but if you look at the fly, the fly is not scared of you. He keeps on attacking you. Right? Sheikh Ibrahim says, you can chase away the fly and the mosquito like that. You can shoo, 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 shoo. You do like that. What happens? In two seconds, they come back. You do like that. They come back. You do like that. They come back. They are so brave. They are so brave. The cat, if you just say, shoo, the cat runs. you will never come back to you. You got to chase it. So although Allah made them weak in their in their, their structure, Allah made them courageous and powerful in their nature. In their nature. So he says that though they will keep on coming to you and attacking you, they will not be scared of you. You can be the president, you can be the king, you can be whatever, you can be an elephant, you can be the lion himself. The flies will come on the lion and sit on the lion. And when the lion chases them away, 
Will they get scared? Wallahi, they will come back again and sit on top of the lion's head. Subhanallah. Look at that. That's a mosquito and a, uh, the fly. That's a lion. Hatta al-muluk wal jababir. Even the kings and the tyrants, the mosquitoes and the, uh, the, uh, the you know, the, the flies are not scared of them. Wal-feel wal asad khalaqahum Allah ta'ala bi ghayati ma yakunani mil quwa salaba. Ibrahim says that the elephant and the lion, Allah has made them so strong and so powerful and so large. But Allah also put in them cowardice. They are scared. They do not like to come near people. The lion and the elephant, they stay in the, in the middle of the jungle. And they hate going out of their safety zone towards human beings. They don't come to human beings. I mean, we go to them maybe, but they don't come to us. They don't like coming to us. The lions and the elephants, they stay in the heart of the jungle. They fear going out to anyone else. So much so that if they hear a group of humans coming, they run away. These big animals, when they hear a group of human beings coming, they run away. Right? And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah. Shaykh Ibrahim said that is Allah's lutf. Allah's lutf. Allah's compassion. Allah's compassion. Why? Because if Allah had to give the lion and the elephant a strong body, as he did, and then he also had to give them the courage and uh, the jura, the outrageousness, uh, uh, you know, the courage of the mosquito or the fly, uh, we human beings would be in big trouble. They would have eaten us all up. If the lions kept on attacking the tigers, the lions, the leopards, if they kept on attacking mankind the way the flies attack us, they just don't get scared, we would all be dead. Of the elephants, they started stampeding all mankind like the, the flies and the mosquitoes do, we would all be dead. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although he made those animals big, but he also made them scared. Well, he made the fly and the mosquito brave and courageous, but then he made them small. So that even if they attack us a lot, they can't kill us. They can't, like, you know, they, they can't hurt you in a very serious way, unless Allah wants that, but otherwise they can't. So this is all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's taqdeer, Allah's proportioning and justice in his creation. Then Mawlana Shaykh Ibrahim says, so he says here that فَكَيْفَ تَتَجَرَّ عَلَى اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَا شِدَّ الْعِقَابِ وَمَا فِي جَهَنَّمِ الْعَقَارِ وَالْحَيَاتِ الَّتِ إِذَايَتُهَا دَائِمًا so he says that, that we cannot even handle these little insects. Allah created uh, a spider. He created the mosquito. He created the fly. And we cannot even bear them, right? If a fly is coming, you chase it away. Uh, you, you can't even handle that. We cannot have a mosquito biting us. We say, ouch, and, we, and you know, it, it pains us. We don't want it. These are the smallest creations of Allah and we cannot handle them. So how, Shaykh Ibrahim then says, then how can we handle the fire of Jahannam and the snakes and the scorpions and the torture that is there, the punishment that is there, how can we handle that? How come we are not scared of that? How come you as a human being are scared of a mosquito but you're not scared of Jahannam? Both are creations of Allah. Both are creations of Allah. The mosquito is a small creation. The Jahannam is a very big creation. But you're scared of the mosquito, but you're not scared of Allah. You're not scared of Jahannam. So Shaykh Ibrahim said that is another lesson here that mankind should understand. If we are scared of little things that Allah created, we're scared of cockroaches, you know, little things, grasshoppers. We are scared of that. And these are small things Allah made. How can we not fear the fire of Jahannam, hellfire that Allah created for the disbelievers and the wrongdoers? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us these examples so that we fear him, that we realize his ultimate and power, we realize his infinite greatness, and we submit to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah said in the ayah about those uh, flies, Ya Yuhannas, Buriba Masurun Fastamiula, 
or people an example has been given for you so listen to it listen to it inna allazina tad'una min dunillahi la yakhluqu dhubaban all those gods that you worship other than allah they cannot even create a fly all these idols that you worship they can't even create a fly and indeed allah says that their example is like the house of a mosquito it 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 looks nice but it can really protect a house of a spider it cannot protect the spider from anything if you just go you just do like that you break the house just like that so allah masalla ala sayyidina muhammad uh sheikh ibrahim narrates the story of a famous uh, king al ma'mun al ma'mun was the, the abbasid uh, khalifa in baghdad the sultan the king of the muslims in his time so when he was sitting on his throne the the flies came and they sat on him so he chased the the flies away then they came back again then he chased them away then he came again then he chased them away until uh he he got fed up and the flies uh were just persistent they were not going away you know they were coming back at him so he called a great scholar called abul huzail abul huzail was a famous scholar at that time in baghdad abul huzail he called abul huzail and he said to him that isn't it true that allah created everything for a purpose there's a wisdom in everything allah made <clears throat> and abu huzail said yes indeed of course allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything with wisdom amalul hakim la yakhlu min al hikma the wise one doesn't do anything without wisdom so then uh, al ma'mun uh, the caliph the king the khalifa he looked at that alim that sheikh and said then why in the world that allah created these flies what is the purpose of these flies what do they do what's the wisdom in having these flies what purpose do they serve so abu huzail said allah created them to humiliate and humble tyrants like you allah created them to humiliate tyrants like you and bring you down to earth because that fly can go sit on your droppings in the toilet and then he can come back and sit on top of you as well and your throne he can sit in the toilet of the lowest person in your kingdom the beggar on the street he can go sit on his whatever and then he going to come sit on your throne and on your head to show you that all of you are nothing in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you the kings and the beggars it's all the same one fly that allah created can teach you that so subhanallah the the king was humbled and he said sadaqta he said wallahi you are right it has humbled us it has humbled us and uh, also that's why the uh, sheikh ibrahim said our ulama say that if it was not if it, it weren't for the breeze the wind and for the flies la antanat ad dunya that the entire world would be stinking the entire world who be stinking why because these dirty things that are there in this world is the flies that eat them up it's not that the flies allah created them for no reason if the world did not have flies in it the world would be rotten and stinking because it's their job to eat up all the filth so don't mind the flies they're there to eat all the filth of course if you got a lot of flies in your house that means you got a lot of filth in your house clean up your house you know but don't blame the flies they are coming because there is you providing the filth for them and they are coming and cleaning up for you if they didn't come the filth will become rotten and smell and and diseased and it will kill mankind uh, and hurt mankind so even that there is a, there's a benefit for them that allah created them sheikh ibrahim says that allah said many will be guided by the many will be misguided by it he says how did allah say many will be guided by it when uh, the guided ones are always few most people are misguided the guided ones are few sheikh ibrahim says li anna ahlu al hidayati qalilun wa ma'a qillatihim fa hum kasiruna fi anfusihim because the guided ones even though their numbers may be few but in their quality and in their strength they are like a lot They, they, their value is more 
the value is much, much more. So therefore, even if the, the people on the truth are few, they are the winners. They are the successful ones. They are the big group. Because their value is more. It's like, like $1 is equal to maybe 100, uh, let's say, uh, Indian rupees, for example. Right? So this is a hundred, this is one, but this one is more valuable than that one. It may be even more valuable than that. So it's one, but the one is more than the hundred. The one is more than the hundred. That's why the people of Hidayah, one is more than a hundred, more than a thousand. Mawlana Shaykh Ahmad Tijana radiallahu said, al bayda minna bi alf, one of my eggs is equal to a thousand of any, any anybody else is eggs. Well, farqhu la yuqammam. And, and the full, fully bred chicken is priceless. Malana Sheikh Tijana radiallahu said, one of my eggs is equal to 1,000 eggs of anybody else. As, and the fully grown chicken of mine, he said, that is priceless. You can't even compare it to anything. And uh, Siri Tayyib explained that the meaning of the egg is the murid, and the meaning of the fully grown chicken is the arif. The, the one who has achieved the ma'rif and the knowledge of Allah. That's priceless. So, uh, that's why Allah says that it, it misguides many and guides many because uh, the misguided people are many in their number and the guided people are many in their quality. So Allah wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad uh, and the reason for that, Sheikh Ibrahim says why the guided ones are little, are always less than the misguided ones. The guided ones are always less, right? Even today, uh, more people are kuffar than Muslims, even though it's 1,400 years since the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but one out of five people on this earth is Muslim, meaning four people, four out of five are not believers. Why is it that the believers are few? Why didn't Allah make it that the believers are the majority? It's because, as Sheikh Ibrahim says, iman, because Iman is very precious. Iman is a very precious gift. It's not just given to anybody and everybody. It's a precious gift. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most independent of his creation. Allah doesn't need anybody to believe in him. Allah doesn't need anybody to worship him or praise him. He's, he's not dependent on anybody. So if nobody worships him or a very few people worship him, it makes no difference to him. It's not like he needs it, that he needs to make a lot of people worship him because he needs that, he loves that. Uh, he is not in need of that. That's why the believers are few. Uh, but Allah says but it is the corrupt that will be misguided by it so when the verses of the Quran are revealed showing you the straight path some people, many people will be guided by it and many people will be misguided by it but who will be misguided by it by the Quran, the fasiqeen the corrupt ones not only corrupt in their actions but more so those whose hearts are corrupt if your heart is totally corrupt with not even a single opening for the truth, then when the truth comes to you, uh, you will not be guided. You won't be guided. You will actually hate it even more. Now here somebody might say that, uh, then does that mean we can't call people to Islam or Iman? No. First of all, we don't know what's in the heart of anybody. So our job is to call everybody. They might, the listener, among the listeners might be the one whose heart is already sealed. You will never accept Islam. Amongst them might be the one who will consider it. Think about it, and amongst them might even be the one whose heart is so open, he will immediately accept it. Our job is to do the da'wah, the call. But that's the first point. The second point is that even if a person is corrupt in their actions and even in their heart, but you don't know if they don't have some type of opening of goodness uh, uh, or truth in their heart, their heart might be. 99% darkness of kufr, uh, but there might be 1% there which is looking for the truth, which is humility, which is goodness. So that's where Iman may enter. That There's a little hole there. The water may go through that, the water of Iman. Only when the heart is completely darkened, completely devoid of Iman, it's 100% kufr. There is not even a hole for Iman there. That is when khatam Allahu ala qulubihim. That's what Allah says in the earlier verses. These are the people I have stamped their hearts. 
right? What happens when you make a big stamp like that? It's like a big dark mark there, right? On the, on, on, on the white envelope, it's stamped. He said, those are the people their heart has been stamped, halas. Now what happens when you stamp a letter? It can't be opened after that, right? Once the letter is stamped, you don't open it now. So once the heart is stamped, Billah, it cannot be opened after that. Those are the people who Allah spoke about earlier and said, oh Muhammad, whether you call them or not call them, uh, just understand that certain people amongst Quraysh, they will never accept Islam because their hearts have been stamped. So you keep on calling the people, but realize that there are some people out there, they will never accept your call because their hearts have been stamped. Who are they? Allah says these people are the ones who break the covenant with Allah, the promise with Allah. What is the promise with Allah? Ibrahim says the covenant or the promise with Allah, the agreement, the deal with Allah, three. Three deals. The first one was the one Allah took from Adam السلام, and his children in the world of the souls before we were created. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all the souls of mankind, of all mankind, all humanity, <coughs> from the loins of Adam alayhi salam, and then ashhadahum ala anfusihim, and then Allah spoke to everybody's soul, my soul and your soul, millions of years ago, and said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Rabb, your Lord? Qalu bala, everybody's soul replied, yes, indeed, you are. So Allah says then after that, so do not say on the day of judgment that you did not know this. You didn't know this. Don't say that on the day of judgment. So everybody's soul knows Allah. Everybody's soul knows Allah. But because the soul comes in the body, the body blocks it from knowing Allah. And we have to find Allah then. But if we connect with our soul, we all know God. We all know the Creator. So Allah said, don't say on the day of judgment, I didn't know about Allah. Your soul did know. So that was the first covenant between mankind and Allah. The first Allah said, Am I not your Rabb? And everybody replied, Yes, you are. Alas to be Rabbikum. The day of Alas. The Sufis call it uh, the day of Alas. Then Allah said, Am I not? Alas to be Rabbikum, your Rabb. So they say, Must they Alas? The ones who are intoxicated by the wine of Alas. Am I not your Rabb? He said, From that day, they said yes to Allah and they remained in that yes. The second covenant, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a, covenant, a special covenant then from the souls of all the prophets. Now, this was only for the prophets, where Allah said to them that if you live in the time of my prophet Muhammad, that all of you have to support him. And they all agreed to do that. And that's why every prophet that came before our prophet spoke. Spoke to his people about Prophet Muhammad. There were two things every prophet would speak to his people about. The one was the first was the oneness of Allah, that only Allah deserves our worship, our complete obedience, our absolute trust, only Allah. The second one to predict the coming of the final prophet. So that when the final prophet comes, the followers of the previous prophets they can go and follow him because they have been predicted already that he's coming. That's why you find in every religion, there is the concept of the one that's coming, right? So that is how they supported our Prophet ﷺ. However, there is one Prophet that will physically come and support our Prophet to fulfill that promise. And that is Sayyidina Isa salam. Jesus Christ, he will physically come back to support our Prophet ﷺ, to fulfill on behalf of all the other Prophets to support the Prophet Muhammad The third promise, that the knowledge will, Allah took a pledge from the knowledgeable ones in the Torah and the Bible that indeed you will proclaim the truth to the people and not hide it. And Shaykh Ibrahim says, this is the pledge that the Yahud, that the Jews violated because they knew about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but they rejected him. They rejected him. There were some of the Christians also who realized Prophet Muhammad's reality, but they still rejected him. They, or they covered up, they didn't tell the people 
the reality of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In his time, Wallahi, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were many Jewish and Christian priests who knew for sure that he is Allah's Prophet. They knew that. They fully understood that. But they didn't tell it to their people. They kept quiet. They were scared to reveal the truth. Like even in our times, you may know that a certain person is a wali of Allah. You may be a sheikh or an imam, and you know that this man is more learned than you, or this man is, is a great wali, but you don't tell anybody. You keep quiet. You, you hide it from people because you're scared that the people might leave you and go to him. Right? That's what happened, right? Oh, if I, if I tell everybody this man is the great wali of Allah, they're, they're all going to leave me and go to him. So let me keep quiet. Don't tell them. Now that's what they did in the Prophet's time. They were scared that if they tell their people that Muhammad is a genuine prophet, they're going to leave them and go to the Prophet Muhammad And that was their loss because they themselves lost the opportunity of being saved and being on the straight path and getting the honor of the dunya and the akhirah. They missed that chance. And in addition to their own sin of denying the truth, they carried the sins of all their people, their entire congregation, because they blocked everybody else as well from the truth. So now they're going to carry the sins of everybody else as well. That's why Maulana uh, Sheikh, uh, the great Waliullah scholar, Al Hajj Umar Al Futi, radiallahu an, said in his uh, book, Al Rimah, Al Hajj Umar Tal, in his book of Tasawwuf, Tariqa and Rimah, there's a whole chapter called that when a, a complete wali comes to your town, then it is necessary for, for all others who are lesser than him in rank to submit to him with their murids and their followers. When a complete wali comes to your town, then it is necessary for all those who are lesser in rank than him and realize his rank, that he is above them in rank, it is necessary for all those ones to submit to him with all their followers. And this is something that a lot of people don't do. And that's the downfall and the pitfall, even in Tasawwuf and Sufism. Because the complete wali comes to renew the path to Allah, to renew uh, the way of Tasawwuf. So those who are incomplete, they should see the coming of the complete wali as a blessing. And say, subhanAllah, we were halfway there, you know, we a little bit there, somewhere there. But this man has the whole thing. And then they should take all their followers who are also incomplete like them and go and submit to the, to the real one so that they can upgrade you know, their, their, their system and, and on the path of Allah. But unfortunately, uh, most people don't do that, right? The reaction of most people is when a complete wali comes to your town, uh, you get jealous, you get scared, uh, and you may, even, you may not tell your followers about it, even if you know, but you won't tell your students about it. And worse still, may even be that you actually forbid your students from going to him. You actually tell your students, don't go to him, stay away from him, out of fear. So this is all, I mean, uh, you know, a whale. It's all hijab and it's all nafs and it is all arrogance and ego. Uh, the lucky ones are those, subhanAllah, who when they see a complete wali, uh, they don't feel humbled or, 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 or sorry, they don't feel humiliated or anything. They submit to, to the, the wali and they take their students also and said to their students also, let us submit to this man because he can guide me and guide you to Allah. And they are the ones that then become great. And they are the ones that become elevated in the dunya and the akhirah. Their name remains. So uh, amongst, I mean, if you look at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, there were Jewish rabbis and there were Christian priests. Uh, uh, they were... Uh, uh, Zoroastrians at that time, fire worshippers. Do we know the names of those priests and those bishops and stuff? We don't know their names. Which of the Christian priests and the Jewish rabbis and the Zoroastrian priests whose names we remember till today and we honor till today and we praise till today from all the Christian and Jewish priests of that time, who's the one that we praise till today? You know who? The ones that accepted Islam. The chief rabbi of the Yahud in Medina, Abdullah bin Salam, radiallahu anh, he was the chief of the rabbis of the Yahud. He accepted Islam. He came to the Prophet, sallallahu when the Prophet came to Medina, he, he came to him and told the Sahaba, I want to ask this man a lot of questions. I want, I'm going to test him out if he's really a prophet or not. I have a lot of questions from the Torah. Let's see if he knows. 
finally, when he got into the Prophet Sallallahu tent, he looked at the Prophet Sallallahu for a while, and when the Prophet turned to him and said, yes, what can I do for you? He said, please initiate me into Islam, and he took the kalima. The Sahaba afterwards, they asked him, Abdullah bin Salam, they said, uh, how come you accepted Islam so quickly? You had a lot of questions to ask. He said, yes, I had a lot of questions to ask him. But wallahi, I swear by the Lord of Moses, the one who revealed the Torah to Moses. He says, wallahi, when I looked at his face, I realized that that is not the face of a liar. He said, when I looked at the face of Muhammad, I realized the light on his face, that this is not the face of a liar. This is a man of God. So Abdullah bin Salam was the chief rabbi of the Jews in Medina. The only rabbi of the Jews whose name is still honored till today is him. He's the one who accepted Islam. Salman al-Farisi was a Zoroastrian. His father was a Zoroastrian priest. He became a Christian priest, a great Christian priest. But he finally accepted Islam because the priest before him, his sheikh, when he was dying, told Salman that my son, the time of our religion is finished. The time of Jesus is finished. The final prophet that Jesus predicted has appeared in Arabia. And he gave him certain signs and, and clues on where to find him. And that's a long story. I don't want to go into that long story of Salman. It's a beautiful story, though. Finally, Salman found the Prophet ﷺ and accepted Islam. So the Christian whose name we remember till today, the Christian priest, is Salman al-Farisi. So those, the point I'm trying to make is that those who submit to the truth, their names will remain. And those who don't submit to the truth because they feel, oh, you know what, that's going to humiliate me and that's going to put me down. And SubhanAllah, those are the ones whose names will be forgotten. Then Allah says, The evil ones are those who cut off what Allah told you to tie. What Allah told you to keep in ties with, that is, they try to cut that off. With who? With Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah wants you to be connected to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they want you to cut off that. As well as, uh, Shaykh Ibrahim says, Rahim to cut off ties with your family. Allah wants you to be connected to your family, but you cut off ties with them. Cutting off ties. So Allah does not like that. And they spread evil on earth. They indeed are uh, the, uh, you know, the losers. They will be the losers. People who are of those qualities by entering into the fire forever. Then Allah says, Allah says to the people of Makkah and by extension to all these believers, how do you deny Allah? And you were dead and he put life into you. How do you deny Allah when you were dead and Allah made you alive? What does that mean, Shaykh Ibrahim says? You were sperms in the loins of your fathers, in the wombs of your mothers. You were sperm. The sperm is not alive in that sense, right? Then Allah made you alive in the womb of your mother. When you came in the womb of your mother, Allah made you alive. You were dead and Allah made you alive by putting the soul into you. When the baby and the fetus is formed in the womb of the mother, it's on the fourth month that Allah orders the angel to blow the soul into it. In the fourth month, when the woman is pregnant four months and the baby is formed, in the fourth month, Allah orders the angel to blow the soul into it. And Allah orders the angel to write on it as well. Uh, how long he's going to live, how much wealth he's going to have, and will he be from the, the blessed ones or the cursed ones? Meaning, will he be a believer or a disbeliever? So this, this is written in our DNA. We can't see it, but it's already there. So Allah says, Summa yumitukum. After that, I give you death again. You were dead, I made you alive, and I'm going to make you dead again. Nobody's going to live forever. And then, Summa yuhyikum, and then I will make you alive again. Summa ilayhi turja'oon, and then you shall return to Allah. So we live, Allah gives us life twice and gives us death twice. First, Allah made us dead. Then he made us alive in this dunya. We were alive. Then Allah made us dead again in our graves. Then Allah made us alive again on the day of judgment. So if the other point that Allah is trying to make here is that if I can, if I can 
bring you alive, make you alive from your death when you were dead and nothing i made you alive once if i can do that once i can do that again i can do it again i can make you alive again from the dead uh, because remember the, the kufar of makkah they used to deny they used to deny resurrection from the grave when the prophet وسلم, said that on the day of judgment uh, allah will resurrect all the people from their graves all our fathers grandfathers great grandfathers allah will resurrect all of them from their graves uh, the kuffar of makkah laughed at him he said what how can the people who are bones fossils inside their graves how can they become alive again abu jahal even came to the prophet وسلم, with a bag he opened the bag Rasulullah said, what's in that bag? He spilled out what's in the bag. It was the bones of a dead human being. The bones of a dead human being, the remains of a dead human being. And he said, oh, Muhammad, are you telling me that Allah can make these bones into a human being again? Allah can make this, these bones alive again? And then Allah revealed the ayah in Surah Yasin that, قُلْ يُحِيَهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ هُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ Tell him, that the one who created these bones the first time, he can recreate them again. If Allah can make them the first time, Allah can make them again. And he has the power to do whatever he wants. Then Allah says, he is the one who created everything in this earth for you. He created everything in this earth for you. So this is Allah's immense blessing on us that he made us human beings and everything else on the earth is for us. That wouldn't be the case if we were animals or insects because the insects are eaten by the animals and the birds and the birds are eaten by the, the animals and we eat the animals. But everything has been created for us. And there's a hadith that Yabna Adam, O son of Adam, I created everything for you, but I created you for me. Oh son of Adam, I created everything for you, but I created you for me. Sheikh Ibrahim says, what is the meaning of Allah created everything for you in this earth? He said for two reasons. By the way, because we think when Allah says he created everything for us, it means so that we can use it all up. No. So that you may use it and so that it may bring you closer to Allah. That it, it makes you realize the greatness of Allah. So everything on this earth has two purposes as far as the human beings are concerned. The first one is to benefit from it. We use it, but don't abuse it. Use it, but don't abuse it. Use it. Allah made it for you as a human being. Secondly, let it bring you closer to Allah. Let it make you realize the greatness of Allah. What's happening today in the world? We are using everything on this earth. In fact, we're not just using it, we're abusing it. We are finishing up the entire resource of this earth. And uh, it is hardly bringing us closer to Allah. We do not look at any of these blessings we have around us as bringing us closer to Allah. We don't see it as a blessing from Allah. Neither is it taking us to Allah. For most of mankind, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about the believers, but for most of mankind, they don't see it as from Allah, neither do they see it as taking them for Allah or to Allah. So they are just abusing everything around them. And, you know, that is the misguidance that, that the majority of the people are in. As Allah says, most people look at my signs and I'm misguided. So he says, Allah Sayyidina Muhammad, that, uh, of course, uh, when Allah says he has created everything on the earth for you, it doesn't mean that, uh, it means everything that he made halal. Everything, oh, sorry, everything except what he made haram. You can't come and say, well, everything, Allah made everything on this earth for us. So I can eat the pig. I can drink the wine. I can... No, except what Allah made haram. So there are things Allah said in the Holy Quran. There are not a lot of things. The haram is not a lot of stuff. But there are a few things Allah said, I have made haram for you because they are harmful to you. So those ones you stay away from because they are harmful to you. Well, are you going to say everything is halal from you on this earth and eat stones? No, you're not going to do that. So harmful things have been made 
haram for us. And uh, it's interesting how the word haram uh, incorporates the word harm inside of it. It incorporates the word harm inside of it. So harm is H-A-R-M. That is harm. Something that's harm, harmful. And the word haram is H-A-R-A-M. So the word harm is inside the word haram. So that's kind of like an ishara for us that everything that is haram is actually having harm inside of it. It's harmful to us. That's why it's haram, because it's harmful to us. Sheikh Ibrahim says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for you everything in this earth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned towards the heavens. And then he made the heavens seven levels. So the heavens are seven levels. Right? And indeed he has knowledge of everything on the earth and everything in the heavens. We know a little bit about what's happening on the earth and we know even less even less about what's happening in the heavens we don't we know nothing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything of what's happening on the earth and what's happening in the heavens mujmalan wa mufassalan in brief and in detail to the finest details every allah knows everything that's happening in this existence in this universe Shaykh Ibrahim says, أَفَلَا تَعْتَبْرُونَ أَنَّ الْقَادِرَ عَلَىٰ خَلْقِ ذَلِكَ إِبْتِدَاءً هُوَ أَعْظَمُ مِنْكُمْ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ إِعَادَتِكُمْ Don't you realize that the one who can create the heavens and the earth and everything in it, the trees, the mountains, the rivers, the animals, the one who can create everything, you think he can't recreate you? He can't make you again as a human being on the Day of Judgment? SubhanAllah. What kind of a weird understanding is that? And Allah is saying that, because the people of Mecca used to believe that Allah created the heavens and the earth, by the way. They used to believe that. In Charles Doman Khalaqa Samawati Earth, Allah, that if they were asked who created the heavens and the earth, the kuffar of Mecca would say Allah. They didn't deny that, that Allah is the creator. Allah is saying, if you believe I created everything, why do you find it hard to believe that I can recreate dead people? So now here, uh, uh, in this ayah, Allah says, it, it appears, Sheikh Ibrahim says, that it appears as if Allah created the heavens, the skies, after the earth. Right? Because the ayah says, Allah created everything on this earth for you, and then he turned toward the heavens, and he divided them into seven. But the other ayah, in Surah Al-Nazi'at, Allah says, then Allah spread out the earth after the heavens. After the heavens. So now here we have a problem. I mean, what was created first? The skies or the earth? Because one ayah says Allah created the skies and then the earth. But this ayah says Allah created the earth and then he turned towards the heavens. So Shaykh Ibrahim says, The way you combine between these two verses, is that Allah created the earth first. Then he created the heavens. But after he created the heavens, he spread out the earth and shaped it the way it is shaped now. After that. So the ayah where Allah says he created the heavens and then he shaped the earth, it doesn't refer to the actual creating of the earth, but the shaping of the earth. So in that way, there is no contradiction between the two. Then Allah says, and remember, O Muhammad, or recall, O Muhammad, when, when your Rabb said to the angels, I am appointing a representative of mine on earth. A Khalifa. Khalifa means representative. Somebody that represents you is your Khalifa. Khalifa can also mean a successor, which is also a representative, but after you die. Right? Khalifa can also mean your representative in life or your representative after you die. 
Now, in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, it doesn't mean a successor. If Allah does not die, that he needs somebody to be his khalifa. But a khalifa is not only when you die. The khalifa is also in your absence. So when I'm not around somewhere, I say, this is my khalifa. He's going to be doing this when I'm not present. Right? So in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's case, the reason Allah is a khalifa on this earth is because Allah is not physically apparent to creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absent from their sight. They don't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they did all see him, then they will be finished. So Allah has a khalifa on this earth because people cannot see him the way he's supposed to, you know, the, the way he is. So it's not because Allah doesn't have a khalifa because he dies and he needs a successor. Billah, Allah is forever alive. But because he is not physically present with mankind, he is absent from their sight. They don't see him. That's why he has a khalifa who represents him. Because most mankind does not see Allah or know Allah. So when Allah, uh, as Shaykh Ibrahim says, يَخْلُفْنِي فِي تَنْفِيزِ أَحْكَامِ فِيهَا And the job of the Khalifa will be to implement the laws of Allah on this earth. That's his job. That the Khalifa will be from mankind because he is going to work with mankind. And his job will be to implement the rules of Allah on this earth. And that was Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam. So... The Khalifa, brothers and sisters, uh, from this we understand that there has to be a Khalifa on this earth all the time. If Allah made a Khalifa on this earth, Adam salam, did not live forever. He died. So can we say that he was the first and last Khalifa? Khalas, after that there was no Khalifa? That doesn't make any sense because the need for the Khalifa remains. In fact, the need for a Khalifa after Adam salam, is even more. Because now there are so many children of Adam and there are good ones and bad ones. You need somebody to represent the law of Allah on earth. Represent Allah on earth. So if there was no need for a Khalifa after Adam, why did Allah make his son Shaykh a prophet? And then his grandson, great grand Nuh and then his grandson Idris and, Right? Idris then Nuh So we know that every generation there was a prophet. So from that we learn that till the coming of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was always a Khalifa on this earth, a Khalifa of Allah, a spiritual Khalifa. I'm not talking about the political Khalifa, the Khilafa, and the rulers and the kings and all that. That's really irrelevant. Those kings, they came and they went. They did good, they did bad. We're talking about the Khalifa of Allah, the one who represents Allah. Till the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were there and they were the Anbiya, the prophets. Every generation, you would find them. After the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu time, the door of prophethood is closed. But you still need a Khalifa. You still need somebody to represent Allah and his deen and his, the reality. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi closed the door of Khilaf, uh, Nubu, or prophethood, but he opened the door of Wilaya. The door of Wilaya, the sainthood. We say, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And that's why the Prophet said, I am the door of no, no, city of knowledge, and Ali is the door. As Shaykh Tijani said, all the Sahaba they received their wilaya from Ali. Uh, they received the knowledge from him. He is the door of the Prophet. The first Wali. And all the other Sahaba also, Awliya Allah. But Ali is that first Wali. He is the first one to receive that wilaya and, and uh, the one who. They completely in inherited the wilaya of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, say the Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, uh, she was the first qutub in this ummah. You find in every generation there will be the Khalifa of Allah on this earth, which is the complete wali. The awliya are many. There will be even the Prophet's time. There were many awliya. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Bilal, Sayyidina Nas, all the awliya. They are friends of Allah in every generation. But there will be the Khalifa. The one that is the complete representative of Allah and his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He's not a Nabi, but he's the most complete follower of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam in every age. So it is very important also for us to try to recognize the Khalifa uh, of Allah and uh, seek the knowledge of that. Uh, you may find the Khalifa, you may find somebody who represents the Khalifa or somebody, even if you, they say if you reach for the stars, at least you reach the sky. If you reach for the stars, you may at least reach the sky. 
So if you look out for the Khalifa, even if you don't find the Khalifa, but you might find some other Wali of Allah that is below the rank of the Khalifa, but at least you will be with that Wali of Allah. And that Wali will be with a bigger Wali who will be with the Khalifa. So you will still get connected somehow. But we need to look for the friends of Allah. We need to look for Kamil al-Asr. Shaykh Ibrahim said, and I conclude with this, it's another surah, but he said, tafsir of the ayah, wa firru ila Allah, where Allah said in the Quran, and rush towards Allah. Flee, not even rush, flee. Run for your life. Flee towards Allah. That's what the ayah says. What is the meaning of flee towards Allah? One of the meanings, Shaykh Ibrahim said, one of the meanings of the flee, fleeing towards Allah, if you really want to find Allah, he says, flee to the Kamil al-Asr, the, the most complete servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your age, to the Khalifa of Allah. Flee to the Khalifa to Allah, because that's where you're going to find Allah. He's the one that's going to show you Allah and how to know Allah. So we, we, we all need to find Allah's friends. We all need to connect to Allah's friends. Uh, we may find the Khalifa, we may not find the Khalifa, but if you are with the friends of Allah, you are connected. To, to the Khilafah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to those who represent Allah on this earth. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connect, connect us to his beloveds, connect us to his Khalifas, to his messengers, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, who is the, khalif, the greatest of all Khalifas of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, inshallah, with these uh, words, we will conclude tonight's lesson from the tafsir of the Holy Quran by Mawlana Shaykh al-Islam. Khalifatullahi, Mawlana Shaykh Ibrahim and Yas radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us and accept us. Bi barakati bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar rahman ar rahim maliki yawm al din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in ahdana as-sarat al-mustaqim. Sarat al-lazina na'amta alayhim ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim wa la'dhalihim ameen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم على آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم أنا ربك رب العزة عما يصفون سلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بارك الله فيكم we see you tomorrow night at the same time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.